A very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us uh, on today's webinar on Decoding Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. Uh, please note that uh, still participants are joining in, so please allow us two or three minutes to start this webinar. Thank you. A very good morning. It's 11.02, and welcome, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to our webinar on Decoding Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. My name is Lydia Wummel Tiagi, uh, and I'm working as a partner with MBT Corporate Services, and it is my pleasure to be the host for today's session. Let's have a look at the agenda for today. So for all of you who don't know us yet, I will start with a brief overview about MBT Corporate Services. Then I will hand it over to my colleagues Lach and Janardan to give an overview and background to move on to the Digital Personal Data Protection Act and the comprehensive discussion, and then I will end the same with a closing remark. So to start with, I will give you a short introduction about MBT Corporate Services. The company is uh, headquartered in Singapore and employs globally around 600 employees, out of which the majority is based in offices all over India. Other than this, we have overseas operations in Japan, Singapore, China, Germany, Qatar, Oman, as well as the UAE. As a group, we are very privileged to work with 5,000 clients globally, and out of which, in fact, more than 100 are Fortune 500 companies. So what we do here in India, actually, we provide services at every stage of a company's life cycle. So right before the investors coming here, we have a feasibility, a feasibility study, then we have this company formation, and then across the entire compliance journey uh, of any company operating in India up to extension or even liquidation of entities. And this we do with six in-house verticals. So we have the risk advisory services, RAS vertical, where we look into internal audit, business health check, SOP development and refining or forensic advisory services. Then we have the transaction advisory services, where we uh, do financial operation and transaction uh, valuation. We do due diligence. We uh, advise uh, from the legal perspective. Then uh, we have a very large taxation, taxation advisory and compliance services team. So here we look into international tax services, corporate tax, GSD, transfer pricing, uh, as well as any applicable taxes here in the region. We look uh, have a separate team working on financial reporting and insurance services. We provide corporate and other regulatory advisory to the CORA vertical. And last but not least, uh, the ACC, where we look into human capital consulting. As a firm, we work generally sector agnostic, so we have been very privileged to support companies in any kind of industry uh, here in India. Last but not thing, one thing which sets us apart, actually, that we have a very uh, integrated, multidisciplinary approach when we look into advising our clients. What do I mean by this? We have people from the industry who have a very pragmatic approach. Then we have people from the regulatory side who used to work, for example, in income tax department and also from the consulting side uh, where we uh, have many people who have previous experience in large multinational consulting firms. So without further ado, it is my privilege that we have two speakers attending today's webinar. Uh, we have Mr. Janardan Singh, who is the Chief Operating Officer for India, and we are also joined by Lav Hotra, who is the partner for legal and secretarial services. So thank you once again for taking our time to uh, attend the interesting session, and I'm sure you will find this useful. So over to my colleagues to take the session forward, please. Thank you, Lydia. Good morning, everyone. Privacy is not an option, and it shouldn't be the price we pay for just getting on the internet. With this thought in mind, Welcome to all of you in our today's webinar, where we are going to discuss the provisions of Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. In recent years, digital transactions have transformed economic as well as social interactions. Use of personal data for provisions of services and other purposes is a common aspect of such transactions. As data flows like never before, it's crucial to understand how we can protect our personal information. In recent years, data breaches have become a global issue that exceeds geographical borders and affects both individuals and organizations. One of the most significant issues and da data breaches is compromise of personal information. Next slide, please. Our personal data, such as social security numbers, 
addresses and credit card details are stored in numerous databases across the world. When these databases are breached, our privacy is violated and we become vulnerable to identity theft, financial fraud, and other malicious activities. Moreover, data breaches can also have adverse impact on businesses as well. Next slide. Now let's take a global view of data privacy legislations. We have witnessed a surge in data privacy regulations across the world over the past few years with the European Union's general data protection regulation leading the way. GDPR, which came into effect in 2018, set a new standard for data protection by giving individuals more control over their personal data and imposing strict rules on organizations that process that. GDPR inspired many other countries to revamp their own data privacy regulations. In the United States, for instance, the California Consumer Privacy Act and recently enacted California Privacy Rights Act have created a framework for stronger data privacy rights. In Asia, countries like Japan and South Korea have introduced data privacy laws similar to the GDPR, while China has implemented its data security law, emphasizing the importance of safeguarding data at a national level. This global trend towards strengthening data privacy legislations can be attributed to several factors. First, the potential growth of digital technology and the internet has led to a massive increase in data collection, which poses significant risk to personal privacy. Second, high profile data breaches and privacy scandals have raised public awareness about the importance of data protection. And finally, we can say that the recognition of data as a valuable assets has led to a desire to regulate its use. Data privacy is not just about protecting data. It's about preserving our individual freedom and dignity in the digital age and maintaining the balance between innovation and personal privacy. Next slide. So in this very context, protection of personal data is a prerequisite for the growth of digital economy. It was therefore need of the R to en enact a legislation that provides for protection and security of personal data of users and recognizes the need to process such personal data for lawful purposes. The Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023 is a significant step in achieving this goal. The primary objective of this act in India is to ensure the privacy and security of individuals' personal data in the digital era. The act aims to establish a higher level of accountability and responsibility to entities operating within India, including internet companies, mobile apps, and businesses involved in collection, storage, and processing of personal. By setting clear objectives and reg regulations, it safeguards the rights of the individuals and also encourages responsible data practices among organizations. This act not only addresses the need for data protection, but also paves the way for a more secure and responsible digital future for our nation. In slides to come, my colleague Lau Malo is going to explore 360 degree aspects of this act. With this, I would like to hand over to my colleague to share detailed insight on this law. Thank you. Over to you, Lau. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, as per United Nations estimates, India will soon have the world's largest population with fifth largest economy in the world with over 700 million internet users with over 400 million smartphone users. India is producing immense data every day. The recent uh, research shows that uh, India is pro producing annually about 150 exabytes of data and will soon become the mo one of the most uh, fastest growing data producing nations in the world. So this calls for government to take appropriate measures and come up with a mechanism to protect the data of personal data of individuals and to prevent its misuse. So it was need of the hour that like other countries, India should have its own comprehensive data privacy regime. Let me start this by throwing some light on how this act has been evolved. Well, it was a journey of six long years. Next slide, please. So in India, the 
data privacy regime started with the landmark Supreme Court judgment of K.S. Puttaswamy, in which the right of privacy was first time recognized as a fundamental right under the Article 21 of the Constitution of India. Thereafter, BN Sri Krishna Committee submitted the initial digital personal data protection bill to the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Thereafter, this bill was tabled before Lok Sabha for the purpose of discussion. Then on 17 December 2019, the bill was referred to a joint parliamentary committee for finding out improvements and suggestions. The JPC committee tabled its report along with the suggested revisions to the 2019 bill in the parliament itself. So on 3rd August 2022, this uh, the recommendations came from the joint parliamentary committee, which resulted in withdrawn of this bill from the parliament. And its result was that another draft of Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022 was released for public consultation. It was till 17 December 2022. And then finally, on 5th July 2023, after six long years, the cabinet approved the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2023. Then on 3rd August, this was tabled in parliament for approving or obtaining consent of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha which was obtained on 7th of August from Lok Sabha and 9th of August on Rajya Sabha. And now on 11th of August, the full-fledged enactment is in front of us, which got the President assent on 11th of August itself and got published in Official Gazette. Though as of now, the commencement notification of the provisions is yet to be announced by the government. As, uh, as on 28th October 2023, there has been an announcement by the IT Minister stating that they are in process of drafting or formulating the draft rules, which will soon be released for public consultation. So once the rule comes and the commencement notification of the act comes, the act and the provisions would be effective. Next slide, please. So after understanding the uh, historical aspects of the act, let us now deep dive into the act to ascertain what this act has in store for all of us. So starting with the key definitions, well, I must say that uh, the, the lawmakers have put in considerable effort in drafting the key definitions adequately, which helps us in understanding the law better. So the first definition is personal data. So as you can see on the screen, it says any data about an individual who is identifiable by or in relation to such data. So there is no classification of any special data, sensitive data, which was, which is unlike section 43A of the existing IT Act. So this means that the coverage of personal data over here is really extensive. Though it is contrary to the provisions of GDPR, which I'll explain you in the later in the session. So after the personal data, the next few definitions of data principle, data fiduciary and consent. So it says the individual to whom the personal data relates. So very simple. I mean, the person, the individual with whom to whom the personal data relates to, which gets then transferred to data fiduciary and consent manager. So where such individual is a child, it includes the parents or lawful guardian of such child, where that person is a person with disability, it includes her lawful guardian acting on her behalf. Now coming on to data fiduciary, well, I must uh, praise the lawmakers that they have very meticulously drafted the definition of data. Though it looks very simple, but when we see it, analyze it, we'll come to know about the fact that the obligations of data fiduciary under the act has been categorically mentioned in the definition itself. So let's analyze this definition. It says any person who alone or in conjunction with other persons determines the purpose and means of processing of personal data. So it clearly says somebody who determines the purpose for which it has to be used, it has to be uh, you know uh, processed and means of processing of personal data. So apart from this, of course, there are other obligations of data fiduciaries, 
which we'll understand in the later slides for makers. Next is consent manager, a person registered with the board. So the, here the board is data protection board who acts as a single point of contact to enable a data principal to give, manage, review and withdraw her consent through an accessible, transparent and interoperable platform. So basically, there are a lot of obligations, as I said, a lot of obligations of the data fiduciary under the act. So of course, it cannot be uh, completed and complied with. So data fiduciary is required to have its own team to handle it, wherein the responsibilities can be delegated. So one of the aspects which requires to be carried out uh, or the functions which are required to be carried out by the consent manager is to view, to manage and you know enable a mechanism wherein the uh, personal data consent can be obtained from data principles and the uh, law requires a privacy notice to be given by data fiduciary to data principle, which has certain prescribed contents, which of course we'll understand in the later slides. So that is the duty responsibility given to the consent manager. So again, this again uh, you know, requires that there should be a proper legal contract between data fiduciary and consent manager so that the responsibilities are delegated to consent manager can be properly implemented. So that's all about consent manager. Next is data processor. Data processor is nothing but an agent of data. So whenever a data principal gives any instructions or any personal data or information to data fiduciary for the purpose of processing. So that processing aspect has to be carried out by the data processor. So let's uh, just have a look at the definition. What is there in the act? It says any person who processes personal data on behalf of a data fiduciary. So as I said, this clearly shows he is a clear agent of data fiduciary. So this particular function is uh, of processing of personal data has been given by data fiduciary to data process. Now next is an interesting definition. So this pronoun she and her has been mentioned in the act for the first time. So I would say it's a really good move by the government of India. Next, of course, is a very relevant definition, uh, which is personal data breach. So the whole purpose of the act is to prevent data breach. And in case data breach happens, then there are some action points which are required to be carried out by data fiduciary under the act. So which we'll, of course, understand in the later slides. So it says any unauthorized processing of personal data or accidental disclosure, accusation, sharing, use, alteration, destruction, or loss of access to personal data that compromises the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of personal data. So I must say, I mean, all these definitions have been very categorically specified, which requires a lot of documentation, a lot of legal obligations to be carried out by the data fiduciary. Next is processing. So it says in relation to personal data, it means a wholly or partly automated operation or set of operations performed on digital personal data and includes operations such as collection, recording, organizing, structuring, storage, adaptation, retrieval, use, alignment, or combination, indexing, sharing, disclosure by transmission, dissemination, or otherwise making available, restriction, erasure, or destruction. So you can imagine almost everything is covered here. So data processing is not that you've got the data from data principal and you start processing it. No, data processing also involves the fact that in case in future, there is something which is being carried out by data consonance with the provisions of the act and data principal to whom the data relates comes aware of it. Then he should also have a right to erase uh, request for erasure of that data. So the processing mechanism is very extensive. So to understand what this is all about, uh, I would request uh, Lydia to uh, go, go to the next slide. So this is the whole uh, mechanism or data flow, which specifies how the data flows. So as I said, data principle, uh, the person to whom the data relates, it then moves to data fiduciary, then data sends instructions to data processor that how to process the data and when to process the data. Data processor then, you know, carries out its responsibilities and duties of processing the data. And thereafter, uh, previous slide, Lydia, then it uh, finally delivers it to the happy customer. So once the services are delivered, as per the specified purpose for which the personal data was shared with data principal, then it is released to the customer. So this is how the data moves. Of course, for to understand this, uh, in the previous slides, I was trying to explain what the definitions are. Otherwise, because it's a very technical act, 
so for an audience it is better we we, under, we start off with the definitions and we understand and then we then the process and the flow can be better understood next slide please so after understanding the historical aspects and the key definitions which of course says that a uh, lot of uh, time has been spent by the lawmakers to define the term so that we understand the law better let's move on to the overview of the entire act so starting with the applicability and non applicability uh, well it is of utmost importance to everyone to know when and where and under what circumstances the particular law would be applicable next slide please so in order to be applicable this digital data personal data protection act states that any data which is being processed in india or outside india this will be covered under that now of course there are certain condition conditionalities which has to be met for india for uh, data protection act to be applicable in india the data should be collected in digital form so it is very important to understand in digital form or if at all the data it is in non digital form it has to be digitalized subsequently then only it can be processed so it is very different from gdpr and uh, the existing uh, it act where there was a classification of the act uh, into offline and online data so this is all gone now then it says uh, the data to be processed and the act to be applicable wherein the data is processed outside india there is a conditionality that if the processing of personal data relates to or in, is in relation to offering of goods or services to data principles within the indian jurisdiction then only it will come under the purview of this uh, digital personal data protection act as you can see on the slide uh, within the brackets it is written subject to special provisions under section 16 so what these special provisions are well under the act the lawmakers have empowered the central government to come up with a notification in future wherein it can restrict the flow of data outside india to any other country outside india uh, for processing by a data so which means uh, there in near future when this act gets uh, notified and uh, the provision gets appointed then uh, the central government would come up with a notification with a list of countries wherein the data can be processed so not in every country the data uh, can be transferred so this would be very interesting to know uh, when this notification comes and when the rules would be notified next slide please now when we've uh, understood how and under what circumstances the act would be applicable so let us now understand uh, the situations or circumstances where the act will not be applicable so processing of personal data for any personal or domestic use would be outside the purview very clear second is personal data made available in public domain by the data principal himself or other person under obligation so data principal as we all understand now it is the person to whom the data relates now i'll explain this with an example so i think we all are aware that uh, you know uh, especially in case of corporates uh, indian companies who are filing their data and compliances with ministry of corporate affairs on regular basis when the data is filed or submitted the on payment of a certain fee it can be assessed by anyone because the data is available in public domain so this may this also uh, involves personal data of uh, individual directors or stakeholders who have been appointed in the companies so because it is available to anyone and everyone in the public domain so it cannot come under the purview of this digital personal data protection for example if anyone has put across his personal details on a social media platform like linkedin facebook or twitter so that becomes available on public domain again so this would be outside the purview of digital personal data protection so this is all about non applicability next slide please now to understand uh, the whole mechanism of how this personal data of individual gets processed the law makers have given in two options one is consent based data the other is non consent based so non consent based means wherein the consent is not required or it is not required to be requested by the data fiduciary to the data principal so that is termed as legitimate uses so something which is implied so when we say consent from data principal now under the act there has been a provision that a formal request has to go from data fiduciary to data principal to request for a consent for processing of a personal data which has been flown from data fiduciary to data principal now 
once this notice is required to be given for requesting, there ha it has to be clubbed with a privacy notice, which has certain con contents and concepts, which I'll explain in the next slide. So Lydia, next slide, please. So as you can see, this is the whole uh, contents mechanism of uh, the privacy notice. So along with the request for consent, uh, for uh, uh, obtaining the consent from the data principle, the privacy notice should comprise of information about the personal data collected. So it should clearly specify that whatever information you have flown to us, it's your personal data and we will be storing it and processing it for specified purpose. Then there should be a mention of a right available under the act for grievance data cell in case they have any. Then in case there is a need to complain to the data protection board, what will be the procedural formalities for that? That will also be mentioned in the privacy notice itself. Thereafter, uh, there, it would be a men mention of right to exercise withdrawal of consent. So as I was explaining in the previous slide, when I was explaining the definitions, uh, there is a right to be given for withdrawal of consent. So in case the data, fidu uh, data fiduciary is carrying out an activity, which doesn't bring reposes confidence in data principle, so they should have a right to withdraw their consent. So which then means the data will not be processed or in case any data has been processed, it has to be erased with immediate effect. Now, uh, it is needless to mention here, the law, the data which has to be processed has to be for a lawful purpose. It should be specified data. It should be simple, unambiguous, unconditional, and should be utilized for processing only to meet a specified purpose. Now, what this specified purpose is all about. So let us understand this by way of an example. Uh, X, an individual, downloads a pharmaceutical application Y. Now we all know whenever we download an application, uh, before we access further to the application, it requires a mandatory consent to be given to the terms and conditions and the privacy policy which that application has. Along with that, the access to the personal information like contacts, uh, name, location, uh, contact numbers, email ID, etc. And then to the contact list as well. So there is no choice for the individual or the person as a data principal. If you want to access the application, you have to give consent to all, all the requests made. But the lawmakers have put in an obligation on the data fiduciary to use the personal data only for the specified purpose. So the app has been downloaded to avail certain telemedicine services. For example, maybe a doctor's advice or maybe buying any particular medicine. So for that purpose, of course, personal data is required. One, two, the terms and condition has to be uh, given consent to because this is as per the internal mandate of that application uh, organization. But contact list, that is, of course, uh, not required at all. So the lawmakers has to not access it, has to give instruction internally to the consent manager and to the data processor that not to process the contact list and only process the personal data, which is required for just carrying out the specified purpose. So this is very important to understand. Then the right of grievance redressal. So under the law, a data protection officer is required to be appointed by the data fiduciary because as I said, data fiduciary itself cannot do anything. So it, he requires a proper team to uh, carry out various functions at a given point of time. So for example, there is any grievance by a data principal that my uh, accurate information has not been taken or I specified that I'm giving more information, but there was no uh, further request given. So the data processing, which you are doing for the services to be availed by me may not be proper. So let um, I need to speak to the data protection officer. So this right specifies the grievance redressal by the data protection officer. But there may be some instances where the data protection officer either has a laid back attitude or is not functioning properly. Then there has to be some mechanism of escalating this matter. So when escalation comes, it, it goes to the data protection board. So of course there has to be some mechanism, some procedural formalities to be carried out. That is what is talked about here manner of complaining to the board of course if the party or the digit uh, data uh, principal is still prejudiced then there are uh, different mechanism to escalate the matter further which we'll understand towards the end of the uh, session next slide please so after understanding the consent based data mechanism let us understand the situations wherein 
the consent is not required to be given. So as I said, under the act, this is termed as legitimate usages. So where the consent is not required. So first is uh, wherein a specified purpose for which data principal has voluntarily provided its consent to data fiduciary for processing its personal data. So this is nothing but voluntary data. So let's understand by way of an example. For example, you and me go goes to a, a grocery shop or a pharmaceutical shop for buying any grocery. And by uh, buying that grocery, uh, when we are leaving the uh, store, we are given any uh, personal data, any contacts, any uh, email ID or name and other details about us, maybe date of birth or our anniversary dates and stuff like that to the uh, grocery shop owner. So this is given as per the uh, your own decision. So which means it's a voluntary data sharing. So herein, no specific consent request is required to be given by the data fiduciary. To Next is wherein there is a situation which leads to a corporate espionage or maintenance of confidentiality of IPR rights and classified information by uh, any uh, data principal which is acting as an employee. So even though it relates to the personal data of data principal, still in order to prevent loss or liability to the employer because of these aspects, the without consent or without sending a privacy notice, their, the personal data of data principal can be utilized or processed by the data fiduciary. Next is in case there is a medical emergency or a pandemic situation or any other natural disaster. Of course, there is no requirement of uh, sending any privacy notice or request for consent. The last is uh, wherein uh, there is any judgment or order or any obligation in issue. So, of course, if the law requires, that has to be given without properly following any specific uh, formalities under the law. Next slide, please. So, as I was talking about my, while I was explaining the definitions, Lawmakers uh, have been meticulously mentioning all the obligation within the definition of data fiduciary itself. But yes, there are other obligations under the act which the data fiduciary is required to perform. Uh, let us now understand this. So to start with, as I said, he requires a lot of people in his team, consent manager, data processor, uh, data protection officer. So for ensuring that everyone does his act or responsibilities in an adequate manner, in a legal manner, there is a requirement to have a legal binding contract with a data processor. Then the second one is to have a correct basis for data processing. See, we need to understand that data processor, as I said, is an agent of data fiduciary. So he would not apply his mind what data has to be processed and what not to be. He will only act upon the instruction given by the data fiduciary. So it is imperative for the data fiduciary to have a correct basis for the data processing. So this is very relevant compliance to be carried out by the data fiduciary under the act. Next is consent notice, which we have understood in detail. This requires a request of consent to be given formally, which would be clubbed with a privacy notice. Next is processing of complete, accurate and consistent personal data. Now here the act is, uh, the lawmakers is putting an obligation on the data fiduciary that before processing, he should have the complete, accurate and consistent personal data. Otherwise, the whole purpose of processing the data and the request to process the data for achieving any desired result will go in vain. So this is a very important task to be carried out. Next is data retention and erasure. So as we understood in the previous slide while I was discussing about the uh, privacy notice and the consent request, in case there is any uh, issue where the data principal feels that the consent has been wrongly taken or the purpose for which it is required to be used is not properly followed, he may request the uh, data protection officer to erase the data and to keep only that data which is relevant. So this again becomes a responsibility and the compliance to be undertaken by the data fiduciary under the act. Next is intimation of breach. Now this is very important. And in fact, this intimation of data breach is quite different from the provisions under GDPR also. So this is a welcome step, I would say, uh, under the act by the lawmakers. So in case, even after complying with all the legal formalities, there is a situation where data breach has happened beyond the control of data fiduciary, for example, he is under an obligation to intimate it promptly, not only to the aggrieved data principal with whom, to whom the data relates, but also to the data protection board, who is the regulatory authority for supervising and monitoring 
the processing of data and the stakeholders involved in flow of data. Otherwise, of course, this levies a certain amount of penalty, which uh, I'll be discussing in the later slides. Next is appointment of data protection officer. So as I was saying, uh, initially also, uh, you need to have a legally binding contact with data processor at the same is the case with data protection officer, because he has his own set of responsibilities to be carried out uh, to deal with the data principle, because everything, anything and everything cannot be done by data fiduciary. Next is data fiduciary is required to maintain reasonable security safeguards to ensure there is no data breach or if it is there, at least to minimize it. Next is to maintain appropriate technical and organizational measures. So this is again a, a very important compliance to be carried out by the data fiduciary. Next is grievance redressal mechanism. So in case the data protection officer appointed by the data fiduciary for redressal of grievances of data principle is not properly carried out, it has to be complained to data protection board and uh, thereafter to the other uh, regulatory authorities, which for which we have a separate slide to explain this mechanism. Of course, the data uh, protection compliance to be carried out by the data fiduciary under the act is uh, would, would more appropriately be understood and the mechanism would be in a better way to be understood by uh, all the stakeholders when the central government uh, ensures that the rules are notified. So let us wait for the rules to be notified and the appointment dates of the commencement notification of the provisions to come to better understand what these compliances exactly are. But at the outset, this is what the act has to stay for uh, the key compliances. Next slide, please. So uh, as we understood that the lawmakers have been very strict on putting across a lot of obligations on the data fiduciaries to ensure the minimization of data breach or misuse of it there must be some situations or conditions where these obligations would be slightly relaxed or rather there are certain exemptions. Let us understand this by way of this slide. So as it is appearing on the slide, processing of personal data, which is necessary for enforcing any legal right, then the obligations of requesting for consent or uh, giving any privacy notice or uh, any grievance redressal by the data protection officer will not apply because this is a need of the hour in case any uh, regulatory authority is enforcing any legal right, this has to be provided. Then processing of personal data by any authority entrusted by law and is necessary for performance of any quasi-judicial, judicial, regulatory or supervisory function. Next is personal data which is processed in the interest of prevention, detection, investigation or prosecution of any offense or contravention of any law for any from for anybody, anybody's perspective. There again, these regulations of uh, obligations rather will not apply. Next is the processing is necessary for a scheme of compromise or arrangement or merger or amalgamation, reconstruction or transfer of any undertaking. So in case any reconstruction happens uh, and it results in processing of any personal data in relation to any data principle that has to be done because in any case, we all understand compromise arrangement cannot be done by mutual consent. It requires regulatory authorities approval. So if regulatory authorities approving it, in a way, this is uh, the need of that R to perfectly implement it. So that way, there is no requirement of any obligations to be carried out by the data fiduciary. Next one is the processing is for the purpose of ascertaining the financial information, assets and liabilities of any person who has defaulted in payment due to on account of a loan or advance taken from a financial institution. So in case there is a such situation happening, of course, the processing of personal data of the person who has defaulted has to be processed. Otherwise, no penal action or prosecution can be taken by any regulatory authority because if the person is defaulted in the loan, maybe there is a next action point of taking uh, you know, property which was mortgaged as an auction. So without processing the personal data, of course, it cannot be done. So these are very uh, relevant exemptions or relaxations which are provided uh, under the act to the obligations uh, of the data fiduciary. Next slide, please. Now, every act, just like uh, Digital Personal Data Protection Act, has to specifically deal with the personal data attributable to children. Now, children here means individuals who has not attained the age of it. So there's another obligation to the data fiduciary that while they are processing the personal data which relates to children, they need to have a specified mechanism which requires 
or ensures a verifiable consent being obtained from the legal guardian or parent of that. Secondly, the act provides for certain restrictions to data fiduciaries before the data of children gets processed. So they have to ensure that while processing the data, it should not result into any detrimental effect on the well-being of a child or it should not result in tracking or monitoring of behavioral or targeted advertising directed at children unless it is specifically exempted under. This is all about the personal data of uh, children. Since we have talked a lot about data uh, fiduciaries, obligations, and of course the exemptions, let us now have a quick look at the rights and duties of the data principal to whom the data relates. Well, uh, the lawmakers specifically states that they, uh, as a data principal, because they, the data is being transferred, they should have the right to access the information. Now, what this information is all about, the information relating to where and how their data will be processed, who are the identified parties, like who is the data processor, who is the data protection officer, who is the consent manager, who will be involved in the processing of data. So this is uh, the right to access information by the data principal. The second uh, right is to in, uh, ensure correctness, completeness, and updating and erasure of data, which of course we have talked about in the earlier slides also. Next right is the right to nominate any individual in case any mishappening happens, uh, which is uh, the case of death or incapacity of the data principal. So there should be a right given to the data principal. The next is right to have their grievances redressed. So this right, as I said, is specifically mentioned in the privacy notice itself. So this is given a real uh, good importance by the lawmakers to ensure that data principal uh, reposes confidence in data fiduciary before their data gets processed. Next slide, please. These are certain duties which are supposed to be uh, carried out by the data principal. Yes, of course, data fiduciaries have to be on their toes to ensure that data is uh, strictly secured. But yes, the law also requires that data principal should also carry out certain amount of duties to ensure that the data which is transferred from data principal to data fiduciary, the purpose doesn't get affected. So in case the data principal is, for example, an entity or an individual or an HUF or maybe any firm. So if it is required to comply with any provisions in relation to that act, those provisions have to be uh, specifically complied with by data principal. Second is not to register a false or frivolous, frivolous grievance or complaint. Otherwise, this leads to whole uh, you know purpose being defeated and wastage of everybody's time. Next is uh, not to suppress any material information while providing personal data for any document. Now, this is very important. See, because you as a data principal is giving some information for processing. So if there is any information which is being suppressed, so the result will also not uh, come successfully. So rather than blaming at the later stage, it is the duty of the data principal to ensure that he doesn't intentionally suppress any material information. The last one is, of course, not to impersonate anyone else. So these are all about rights and duties of data principal. Next slide, please. So as I was saying, there are a lot of obligations to be carried out by the data uh, fiduciary and his team. So there is uh, the act is bound to have certain PLN provisions on the data fiduciaries. So, so is the case. So as it is appearing on the slide, there are different penalties being uh, levied for different categories of breach. So just to have a, a example. So in case the breach in observing any obligation of data fiduciary to take reasonable security safeguards to prevent personal data breach, and it is found out later on by the data protection board, the penalties may extend up to INR 2500 million. The next is in case there's a, <coughs> sorry, breach in observing the obligation to give the data protection board any notice of personal data breach. So as I was explaining uh, the contents of uh, privacy notice, there is a requirement that an intimation is required to be given uh, to the data protection board and to the data principal by the data fiduciary in case any breach happens. In case that intimation is not given, there is a penalty up to INR 3000 million. Next is breach in observance of additional obligation in relation to children under section nine, which we have just understood in the previous slide. There is a penalty up to INR 2500 million. 
then there are other duties under section 15 under section 10 and uh, un under the uh, prescribed rules which of course we all are waiting for wherein the different penalties have been uh, specified for different categories of uh, breaches by the data fiduciaries next slide please so this is the grievance redressal mechanism which i was talking about of course till now we have understood that initial grievance redressal duties and responsibilities responsibilities are vested with the data protection officer which which is appointed by the data fiduciary in case the grievance is still not redressed there is a mechanism which is mentioned in the previous notice itself to approach data protection board so this is one of the first regulating authority under the act but that has to go uh, within a prescribed time which will be mentioned in the rules which are yet to come so in case even the data protection board gives an order but the interested party or the data principal is still not satisfied or it still feels aggrieved within 60 days of that order he or she can file an appeal to TDSAT. This is an appellate tribunal under the act which says Telecom Dispute Settlement and Appellate Tribunal. Now, if there is an order which is come up from a TDSAT and that is also doesn't specifically satisfy the concern of data principle, an appeal can always be filed with the Supreme Court. So that is all about the grievance redressal mechanism. But yes, under the act, there is an alternative dispute resolution which is also specified. So in case the data protection board is being requested by the data fiduciary who has uh, somehow committed any breach or there is a complaint, formal complaint made by data principal to, and he requests to the data protection officer, or to the data protection board rather, for carrying out the mechanism of prosecution or proceedings as an alternative dispute resolution that can always be done through mediation. Next one is in case the data fiduciary was uh, found non-observant under any of the provisions, but he feels that there is a lot of obligations and a lot of penalties mentioned under the act. He can give a voluntary undertaking to the data protection board, wherein he can specify that the reasons of non-observance of these specified provisions and request for liberalization or uh, liberal view to be taken by the data protection board and uh, by the data protection officer for the purpose of evaluating or prosecuting the data fiduciary. So that's all about the grievance redressal mechanism. Next slide, please. So, uh, of course, we have now understood the obligations and rights of the stakeholders. This act, uh, while being enforced, has also amended provisions of two more acts, which is Information Technology Amendment Act 2008 and Right to Information Act 2005. So, I'll start with carving out a confusion among the stakeholders, wherein uh, with the enforcement of this act, it has not completely repealed the information existing Information Technology Act. It is still in place. Only few provisions have been uh, omitted, which we'll understand in the next slide. Next slide, please. So as you can see on the screen, Section 43A, which specifies uh, the penalty for the data breach of only INR 50 million, that has been enhanced to INR 2500 million. So that is the reason section 43A has been omitted, which this has been uh, incorporated within the Digital Personal Data Protection Act itself. So that's the reason of omission of this provision. Next provision which has been omitted is section point number three, which is section 87, subsection two, clause OB, which specific, specifically says that central government to make rules regarding security practices and procedure and sensitive personal data. Now this provision has been specifically incorporated within the new act, which is Digital Personal Data Protection Act itself. That is the reason this provision, for the purpose of uh, ensuring that there is no confusion or duplication, the provision has been omitted. Next one is point number two, which is section 81. So originally, this uh, provision used to say that IT Amendment Act 2008 to have a overriding effect on any other laws without affecting the right of person provided under the Copyright Act and Patents Act. But since this Digital Personal Data Protection Act has also come and some provisions of IT Act is still in place, so it was a need of the act that this particular provision of IT Amendment Act should be modified. Accordingly, now the nomenclature or the reference of Digital Personal Data Protection Act has been inserted. So now it says IT Amendment Act 2008 to have an overriding effect on any other laws without affecting the rights of persons provided under the Copyright Act, Patents Act, 
and digital personal data protection. Now let's move on to the next piece of amendment, which is Right to Information Act 2005. Next slide. So it just talks about the exemptions or you can see the conditions under which the Right to Information Act will not be applicable. So earlier it was a very exhaustive provision, which specifically states that any information relating to personal information, the disclosure of which has no relation to any public activity or interest, that will be exempted under the purview of uh, the RTI. Then the next is information which causes unwarranted invasion of the privacy of the individual. Unless, of course, the central public information officer or state public information officer or the appellate authority is satisfied that in the larger in public interest, it justifies the disclosure of such information. But now with this amendment or digital protection, digital personal data protection act coming into enforcement, this has been narrowed down considerably. So it just says information related to personal data. So any information which can be proved that it relates to personal data would be outside the purview of this act. So this means that uh, this would kind of adversely impact the ability of the people to access information because anything and everything which relates to personal data would be outside the purview of this act. So we'll understand the implication of this act once the specified provision gets an effective date by way of a commencement notification of the act. Next slide, please. Since uh, Digital Personal Data Protection Act is a privacy uh, notification act of India, but this all started uh, with a more elaborated framework of GDPR. So it is imperative that we can have a short comparison with GDPR. Let us uh, understand the uh, differences based on certain parameters. So first is the scope. So it says handling of digital personal data within India. Yes, of course, when we were uh, discussing on the uh, applicability, it specifically states that uh, the personal data processing can also happen outside India, but th there is a precondition for it. Otherwise, mainly data to be processed within India, which is collected in digital form or it is subs subsequently digitized, only that can be covered under the Digital Personal Data Protection Act. However, EU has a different mechanism. Uh, rather GDPR. So it covers individual living in the EU, European Union, and businesses outside the European Union that provides products or services to European Union citizens. All that will be covered under the scope of GDPR. Next is classification of data. So as you can see, GDPR categorizes personal data, sensitive data, special data, any specific category of data to be uh, coming under the purview of GDPR. However, under DPDB Act, there is no such class classification. It only says personal data of individuals. So which means any and every personal data can be accommodated here. Next is data breach notification. So as we have understood till now, data breach notification to be given by data fiduciary to the aggrieved data principal and to the data protection officer is absolutely mandatory. In case it doesn't happen, this amounts to levy of penalty, but no such provision exists under GDPR. So I would say this is a welcome move by the lawmakers under the DPDB Act. Next is consent manager. A consent manager basically has been casted with some obligation relating to view managing the consent and requesting consent uh, under the Act on the instructions of uh, data fiduciary. There is no such concept of consent manager under GDPR. This is again an additional move uh, brought in by the lawmakers under DPDB Act. Next, of course, is penalties, which we have understood. So under the DPDB Act, upper limit of the penalties for non-compliances is up to INR 2500 million in certain cases. And un under GDPR, it says Article 83.4 sets forth fines up to 10 million euros or in case of an undertaking, up to 2% of its entire global turnover over the preceding financial year, whichever is higher. So this is the penalty mechanism under GDPR. Next is language. So language basically, it says the consent notice, uh, which is nothing but a privacy notice which is to be given by the data, rather consent manager on the instruction of data fiduciary to data principal. Therein, the option has to be given whether the data to be processed or the information to be given to the data principal would be in English or any other language which is specified in 8th schedule of Indian constitution. Now this Indian constitution 8th schedule specifies 22 languages. So this clearly indicates that uh, there is an additional work given to the data fiduciary to ensure that it has a mechanism 
where in 22 languages can be accessed by the data principal while receiving the notice there is there was no such requirement under gdpr so there these were the differences of uh, gdpr uh, versus uh, dpdb act let us now move on to the most important aspect of this act see we have understood that there are a lot of obligations under the act to be carried out by the data fiduciaries but to ensure the data fiduciary are compliant with the act there has to be certain prerequisites which they are supposed to do to start this the first is transparency so uh, as we have understood the data uh, fiduciaries are required to give privacy notice and request for consent so it has to be very transparent concise and clear so that the data principal can very well understand it and he feels uh, confident that his data is going in safe hands so the data fiduciary is required to maintain utmost transparency next is data security of course the act provides that uh, sufficient data security measures has to be taken care of by the data fiduciary to ensure there is no unauthorized access and uh, which results in data breach of course or if the misuse of data can be prevented such as encryption etc next one is data transfer now to process the data the data may be transferred to any third party which could be a consent manager or maybe a data processor or it there will be a situation where data is to be transferred to international locations so adequate mechanism has to be carried out by the data fiduciary to ensure that whenever data is transferred it doesn't results in any misuse of data or any ambiguity or any data breach next one is data protection impact assessment so this is not required by law but then uh, it is suggested that data fiduciary should have its own internal impact assessment mechanism to ensure that the situations of uh, data breach can be if not eliminated can be minimized and the ambiguity if any can be eradicated so that the whole mechanism of data processing gets specifies the purpose for which it is given. next is legal process so we are talking about the law so of course there are a lot of compliances to be carried out to ensure that processing gets properly and adequately done the data fiduciary needs to have a legally a uh, binding contract with the data processor with the consent manager and the data protection officer and to uh, ensure that there has to be properly uh, properly drafted contractual obligations so that's all about the legal process next is data minimization now this is very important so of course as a part of data flow lot of data gets communicated by data principal to data fiduciary sometimes because of uh, no malefied intention at the part of the data principal access data comes to the knowledge of data fiduciary so it is his duty to to have a proper mechanism so that unnecessary data should not be processed only the relevant data should be processed uh, for a specified purpose to ensure that the processing goes uh, in a speedy expeditious and uh, smooth manner next is training so data fiduciary is required to give tra regular training to its employees to promote the mechanism of privacy practices to be followed and to also tell them uh, in advance that this is a personal data this has to be processed in a uh, seamless manner and all the confidentiality obligations should be specifically maintained so a regular training is recommended next is importance of record keeping of course the act requires a lot of compliances to be undertaken so and the data to be processed so there may be a situation where there is any complaint mechanism being followed by data principal so at that time to ensure the data fiduciary showcase itself that everything is in order the compliance carried out by is by it can be showcased in a form of a record or uh, the data which has been processed can be recorded as a uh, you know proper mechanism so that whenever the authority comes for any audit or any search or uh, investigation data fiduciary should not feel uh, aggrieved next is of course cooperation so in case any audit uh, is carried out on any search or investigation is carried out by any regulatory authority uh, it is a duty of data fiduciary to extend full cooperation with those authorities be it a data protection officer be it a data protection board or any other authority so this is these are the pre nine prerequisites uh, which we feel for uh, ensuring data fiduciary to be in compliance with the act so with this i end my session today thank you so much for your patient listening thank you over to you lydia
thank you so much, Love and Janadan, for such an insightful and knowledge sharing session. I think we all now understand that this data privacy law would be of great importance to all of us as the number of data breaches have increased manifold. This shows that cybersecurity is what is required to be strictly adhered to by all the businesses, considering that the attackers always keep on devising new ways for sneaking in the databasing and doing mischiefs. In light of these recent legislative requirements, businesses are mandated to establish and uphold a rigorous framework for compliance. As elucidated by Love in his session, ensuring adherence necessities, the acquisition and implementation of comprehensive documentation, robust information technology security solutions, and export advisory services, regular employee training, and cooperation with statutory authorities. These components collectively serve as a vital bulwark against regulatory infractions addressing the requisite safeguards demanded by the new legal provisions. We here at MBG Corporate Services have a dedicated technology advisory team who has expert knowledge to assist businesses in ensuring data privacy compliance and other IT needs. Hence, we would like to invite you in case you need any assistance or you have any queries relating to today's session to drop us and communicate with us at communications at mbgcorp.com or give us a call and we will be gladly to assist you. So once again, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for joining us today and thanks a lot uh, to the speakers Janadan and Love for giving us such an insightful session. We wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you and take care.